Welcome to Performance Anxiety. This week we spend time with Miki Bereni of Poroshka. You might also recognize her from her first band, Lush. Her path into music is a lot different from most. She talks about working with Robin Guthrie, touring with Lollapalooza in the early 90s, and how she left music behind completely after Lush's drummer took his own life. After a 20-year absence, Lush reunited, and it lit a spark within her that really started burning with her new band, Poroshka. And we get a Moose cameo. Follow Poroshka Band on social media. Follow us at Performance ANX on Twitter and Instagram. Merchandise is at performanceanx.threadless.com. Here's Mickey and a little bit of Moose. Hi, I'm Mickey Brenny. I'm in a band called Poroshka. Um, you may know me better from a band called Lush, and you're listening to Performance Anxiety. That was awesome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate <laughs> Great. it. So it's I don't been... have to do seven of them. No. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on. I really do appreciate it. That's fine. So. <clears throat> I literally just remembered about 10 minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh! I've got that stupid podcast I got to do. <laughs> no, it wasn't the. It wasn't that. Wasn't the tone. It was just that I had a bit of a bit of a Friday night, and then I just knew there was something I was forgetting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've taken my HRT tablet. I've taken my cold remedy tablet. I've made my bread, and I thought something's missing. <laughs> Oh fuck! Bloody <laughs> podcast. I don't know how to use FaceTime. What am I doing? Hang on. Okay. But anyway, it's fine. It's fine. All right, good. Well, I know it's a, it's a little bit of a, of a time difference, so I really do appreciate you having a little bit of time for me. And what time is it there? It's uh, ten o'clock in the morning. Okay, that's not too bad. No, 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 not that's fine. I, I had one. I'll have athletes on. Well, I, I do another sports podcast, and I had a. I, athletes on from time to time and they're a little harder to schedule i had a guy who from the town i live in now but he's playing for a basketball team in greece so wow. yeah to get him i had to be up at like three in the morning to record him so Yikes. <clears throat> yeah that one took a little bit of timing and you I really really had to want to have him on so <laughs> <laughs> but he's a nice guy he's from the town i live in now in winchester virginia so he, it's a uh, it was worth it Great. So, <laughs> So, what I want to know a little bit about how you got into music in the first place. So, were you born and raised in London? Yes. Okay. And were your parents musical at all? Um, I mean, yeah. My mom plays the piano. Um, my granny used to play the piano. Um, I don't think my dad was musical at all, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from singing Elvis songs in the car on the way to school, like no, <laughs> um, so no, it wasn't like a massive part of you know growing up. I didn't really have music lessons apart from at school, so it wasn't like it was a, a particular thing. I think it was more um, just you know. I, I do remember when I was at, I've moved a lot of schools actually, <clears throat> um, but I remember sort of being uh around sort of 11 when a lot of that scar kind of stuff you know like madness yes. and special and all of that stuff was in the charts and number one you know so it was which when you're a kid and you don't have any other siblings certainly not you know really that was you know you get your music from the pop charts you know right, right, yeah. but it was actually very very good music to have in the charts I've got to say I mean I loved Blondie and I loved you know other chart stuff as well but I do remember that particularly at that school um, which was a very sort of inner London place called Labrador Grove in West London which now is quite well healed but then was you know very multicultural lots of different races you right. know all kids from different backgrounds, mostly, you know, council estates and working class. Okay. And actually that music was like a big part of everybody's life as oh, kids. Yeah. You know, it was really sort of fun and exciting to get into. And I just remember sort of, you know, doing all those two-tone drawings on <laughs> my pencil case and, you know, that <laughs> yep. kind of thing. So I think when you when you get a move, sort of musical movement like that when you're young, uh, you know, a, a particular period in your life, it can really sort of – take it take you over can't it and, oh yeah and you know it's 
and I, you know what's interesting as well? I, I think I watched something by Madness the other day of being on top of the pops and I forgot how young they were. You know, yeah. they were only like 18 or something. Oh, wow. So again, you Jeez. know, when I first saw them doing like My Girl or whatever, I mean, they were really, really young themselves. So it was, you yeah. Know, so anyway. At that point, you're well, you're even younger. So you, you see these guys, are, oh yeah, those guys are in, they're grownups. And exactly. It takes a while for you but, to go back and look back and see that, no, they were kids. But but even then, I think you can you can sort of see that these are kind of young people, you know, much easier as a sort of 12 year old, I think, to relate to someone who's <laughs> seriously just still actually in their teens, you know yeah. what I mean, than, than getting into, you know, like a, when I was a little bit older, like a lot of people at this other school were, you know, sort of into their older siblings music or their parents music. So it was like Bob Dylan and, you know, Led Zeppelin sort of seventies music and it yeah. it just didn't really resonate with me because all the doors, you know, and because oh. I thought, well, these people are like really fucking old yeah. or dead. <laughs> yeah. And you know and all yeah. I'm saying is at that age, you know, oh, of yeah. course I'm not gonna discount all the music by older dead people, but at the time yeah. I think when you're sort of thirteen or something, you want something that's really current and yeah. kind of happening now. So so I think that was my first real, you know, sort of so sort of slightly obsessive getting into music and actually buying albums and listening to every track and not oh, just the one that's on top of the pops it all played on the radio if you see what i mean so is that what inspired you to, to start playing music or, or we, did you start with guitar or were you on piano or how, how did you get started to actually play I, I didn't think of playing music at all and oh. basically i think what got me into that was when i was around 14 there was a group of us at school, including Emma, who I went on to form Blush with. And we all got into going to see bands. I mean, I think initially through, right, like, again, real pop stuff like Duran Duran or oh, yeah. Haircut 100 or something like that. Oh, you my know? gosh, yes. <laughs> Boy Meets Girl. Yeah, that Japan, great song. Yes. That band, I remember them. So these were all the things that were in the charts. And... So we would go along to like a, a what would be a big show, you know, okay. in a sort of seated London venue or something. But then we'd go and see their support band and then we'd go and see their support band. And then these things can happen really rapidly. And without within like sort of eight months, you find yourself sort of, you know, I don't know, downstairs at the Clarendon in Hammersmith in a pub that holds about you know 120 people or something watching some bizarre what at the time felt like oh my god I don't even know what this is yeah. you know this yeah. type music and I think I mean we did know about that stuff because we would listen to John Peel and we did know about these bands but I think to have the courage to go actually go to those gigs when you're that young yeah um needed to be sort of like I say filtered down through the the Duran Duran and the Le and then the, you know, and then the yeah. down, 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 down. Well, and um, that makes total sense because it's, you know, at that time, bands like Duran Duran, they were big. So you, you're not going to catch a band like that in a smaller club. But you were in your early to mid-teens doing that. That's I, that's pretty crazy. I, I remember the first show that I saw, uh, I was I 16, but it, it was Rush. So we ended up going to this enormous stadium and my buddy's yeah, my buddy's mom ended up driving us, and she. But then she left. I don't know. She she drives us to this big forty thousand seat arena, and it's like, enjoy. And I'm like, oh, okay. So I, I saw who was it? it was a uh, Mr. Big opened up for Rush, and uh, this is, I guess this is a Presto tour. So it was like late eighties. I'm just kind of think sitting there thinking, this is kind of what, what the hell's going on? I'm my parents. It would just they would kill this lady if they knew that she just dropped us <laughs> off at this enormous arena with 40,000 strangers and just said, I'll pick you up in a few hours. Where? I don't know. Where, where are you going to be? I don't know. We'll find you. And this is obviously before mobile phones as yes. well. Yes. Yeah. This is, like, <laughs> right. this is, I think, 88 or 89. Oh, my gosh. I, I can't believe it. So, and same thing. That's we're coming into starting to see the opening acts. And like, oh, these guys are pretty good. I wonder if, when they're going to be touring or and so that kind of opened me up to in a similar fashion to, to the way it opened you up uh, though i was a little a couple of years later than you 
You're doing it at 14. Yeah, I would wait till 16. And I think also it was that I didn't, when I look back on it, I don't think I really differentiated between, because it was just all stuff in the charts. I didn't really differentiate between, say, something like Culture Club or, or like I say, Haircut 100. Right. And Teardrop point. Explodes and Echo and the Bunnymen, who were playing really big venues as well. And they were in the charts as well. But, of course, going to a gig like that or even The Fall, you know, oh, wow, I think yeah. that was the, fall. It was the first gig I went to on my own, and that was at the Lyceum. And I was kind of terrified. None of my mates would go with me. Oh, my gosh. But, you know, so all I'm saying is I didn't, I didn't really know the difference between, like, The Fall or The Simple Minds. Or, so all these bands were just in the charts, and you would go, okay, I'm going to go and see them. Okay. But it would, each of those support acts would leave you, lead you down quite different paths, actually. Oh, and absolutely. And I think it, what was quite nice about that is that we were, you know, when all four of us in this little group of friends were going to see bands, we didn't really, you know, we didn't really have any snobbery about it. So, and that even carried through to when we'd actually then start to go to like lots and lots and lots of gigs like five gigs a week you know yeah. in little pubs around London and at the time it was quite factional you know people who saw kind of anarcho punk bands only saw anarcho punk bands and slagged off everything else and people who saw kind of you know indie bands were very separate from the band people who went to see psychobilly bands oh, or wow. yeah. you know punk bands and and actually we would go to all of them so I would literally be seeing like the Smiths and the Sisters of Mercy and, you know, I don't know, the Guana Bats or yeah. something. Or oh, my gosh, I forgot Hicksons about those guys. Or, <laughs> 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 you know what I mean? Yeah. So just anything. We were like, oh, yeah, we'll go and see them. And what is there anything on Thursday? We want to go to a gig and we just just go. That's awesome. That's I, a buddy, my best, one of my best friends, this guy named Ed, we would do the similar because we, we had a lot of intersecting interests musically, but there were some things that he would listen to that I was just not like, I was never big into punk, but he loved punk and I was more into the psychedelic stuff and that wasn't really his gig, but we all, we had intersecting paths. So we, would, Hey, I want to go see this band. Okay. But when these guys come around, you're coming with me to go see these guys. And so that's, that's, that's another way I got exposure into bands that I'd, didn't really think I would like and ended up liking like mud honey stuff like that so but yeah. and don't you think that it also see I, I can remember struggling with certain bands but it was always I, I didn't really disma dismiss bands as shit I always thought well it's my I'm not seeing everybody yeah. here is obviously thinking this is great so I just need to make a bit more effort yeah I, yeah and, exactly and then me with punk specific you know particularly anything punk because I had this notion because everything I knew about punk was like the Ramones and so I was I would go to my these, these shows with my buddy I'm like everybody's digging these, these songs are really short there's like no guitar solos everybody's yelling and it's really shouty. I don't know what the hell's going on. Why aren't I liking this? <laughs> What's wrong with me? Why, is, why am I not getting this? <laughs> so It's funny, actually, because I was just literally yesterday on Twitter, this guy kind of messaged me, and we, he used to write a fanzine, and me and Emma wrote a fanzine. This was part of our early foray into the music scene. Yeah, so I want to hear about this. One. We were really young, you know, we were only about sort of 15, 16 okay. and too shy to speak to anyone. So, and there was a really big thriving fanzine scene. So we decided, well, why don't we write a fanzine? And that way that kind of, it's a bit of an icebreaker and we could get to know people. And yeah. um, so anyway, this guy got in touch and funny enough, he said, oh yeah, do you remember me? I, I came down from Norwich because he wrote a fanzine and he said, I, we went to see the Ramones together. <laughs> oh my god! <gosh. laughs> and that was 1985, and I was going, "Oh my god!" <laughs> that's oh, a funny coincidence. <laughs> that's wild. Oh man, see, Ramon are bringing everybody together again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, similarly, yeah. I, my buddy Ed, who was a huge David Bowie fan, and I was in and out of Bowie. You know, I, was, I, I liked some things, I didn't like everything. But my buddy Ed was—he he loved everything Bowie. So when he hooked up with Nine Inch Nails. I wasn't a Nine Inch Nails fan either, but I, I kind of liked the um, uh, outside, the David Bowie outside album. Like, all right, we'll, we'll give it a shot. And we went and saw him 
David Bowie live in a little tiny club in uh, New York. And it was one of the coolest experiences ever. It was just a, an amazing wow. show. And it kind of turned me uh, not into a Nine Inch Nails fan because it was basically Nine Inch Bowie. You know, it was it was the boring <laughs> Nine Inch Nails band with David Bowie fronting. But I got more of appreciation for the music because I got a chance to find, to hear it live. And, and, you know, it sounded a little bit different and and more powerful to me live than it was on, on the album. Wow. That's remarkable. Yeah. So, yeah. So it, it was a hell of a show, too. I mean, it was a little tiny club and they had all that. The, it was the tour where uh, I'm trying to I think I don't think it was the uh, outside tour. I think because he did two with them. He did that one um, American or I'm Afraid of Americans, that whole era. So he did two. And I don't remember if it was the first or second album he did. But it was crazy because in a little tiny club, they've got this big stage presence. They've got this ma- wrapped up mammoth, uh, mannequins hanging from the ceiling. I'm like, how do you do this in this little tiny place? You got, uh, you know, a, a normal band come in and they're not going to be able to do that. But David Bowie's got right. this amazing stage presence in this little club. So it was awesome. God. So you started off doing this fanzine that you brought it up. So how long had you known Emma before you started doing this fanzine? Um, Emma came to the school I was at. Um, I think we were about 14, 13 or 14. And yeah, so I think, you know, it was a, a kind of, it was a private school in London. I mean, I'd been to about six or seven bloody schools by then because oh, my wow. parents were divorced and I'd lived with my mum for a while in Windsor and then I came back and then she moved to America. So then I was living with my dad. I went to, you know, uh, so many different schools. So anyway, I ended up at Queen's College, which is a private girls' school okay. in London, which my mum funded um, from her sort of, you know, American life. <laughs> <laughs> but it was... And, it, you know, I don't want to slag it off because, you know, school is school and it every school is full of, like, hardworking people who want to do their best. But the one thing was that, you know, I, you know, it's not like I was, you know, poor, poor. I wasn't living on a council estate or anything like that. But I was in with, you know, me, Emma, all of the girls that we were friends with were sort of not, on that level of wealth okay. that most of the girls were. And it does sort of bond you together a bit when you're from a, a, a sort of middle class, but your parents are sort of, you know, basically making a big sacrifice by spending a lot of money to send you to a certain school. But you can't keep up in any other way. Mm-hmm. You know, these girls were going to like balls and they were going skiing in the spring and you know, their lifestyles were so utterly different yeah. that part of, I think, our little group of girls banding together was actually an acknowledgement that there's absolutely no way we can keep up with these people. We have to find a separate identity. And that separate identity was, there was no uniform at the school. Okay. So, you know, again, couldn't keep up. These girls were going shopping in South Martin Street, which, yeah. if you don't know, is like a really fancy sort of, you know, okay. boutique sort of place. So, of course, you know, actually then we were turning up with our clothes from the secondhand shops and the Army and Navy store and and home haircuts and yep. funky this. And, do you know what I mean? Because actually then we could have an identity that wasn't, you know, just less than you know what was surrounding us it was right. our you know well we've got this and that's what i think got us really into music because again we could, we weren't invited to those parties we weren't welcome in those scenes because oh, we yeah. were seen as like you know common or whatever right so yeah we but we were very lucky that we had each other because i think going to gigs at that very young age i'm not sure that i would have had the courage to do it on my own so it was really good to have like a bunch of girls to go with oh yeah and you know and, and safety I think in numbers I really liked, well totally but what i really liked about um gig culture separate as opposed to like club culture was that it was you know you pay money you go in and people are actually people were really nice you know there's a sort of camaraderie everybody's there to see the same band yeah. you know when people are dancing if someone falls over everybody picks them up whereas when I went to clubs you know the few times I went with someone who would take me I just found it very judgmental 
people looking you up and down, uh, you know, a bit of a meat market, you know. So I think that my avenue into being in a band was actually being involved in that gig culture and the whole community around it. Okay. The fanzines, yeah. the politics going on CND marches and supporting the miners' strike and everything, everything came out of that world of being in a sort of community of people okay. who were into live music and a counterculture. Right, okay. So at what point did you go from enjoying the the gig culture to just wanting to be part of the gig culture and starting a band? I think because you get to a certain level where you realise that the people getting on stage, bless them, right, but when they're third on the bill supporting, I don't know, the surfing lung or something, yeah. in, you know, <laughs> in, like, some pokey little pub in East London, yeah. you sort of realise that there are people getting up who have barely managed to even rehearse, you know. They're just having a bit of a laugh. Yeah. <laughs> and it's sort of chaotic, but it's fun. Yeah. And you sort of think, well, fucking hell, I think I could do that. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and I always think it's quite interesting when people interview musicians about, you know, what inspired them to join a band or actually perform themselves. You know, my thing is, is I, yes, I love the Teardrop Explosion. Yes, I love Blondie. Yes, I loved all these bands, but not in a million years did I think I could do what they do. Right. Whereas seeing sort of crappy little bands have a go yes. in some <laughs> shitty little pub, <laughs> that's the thing that made you think, oh, okay. I, I could do that. <laughs> that's awesome. That's so great. I love that. See, and that, that's a totally perfect, beautifully honest answer too. All right. So how did you meet everybody else in the band? How did, how did the, did you guys gel? Was it at college or was it from gig going to the gigs uh, of other bands? How did y'all meet? Well, I think so initially Emma joined a band called the Rover Girls and then I joined a band called The Bugs and we were both playing bass. And these were these sort of little bands that were on the scene. But I think, you know, Emma in particular, I think, really wanted to write her own music. So we started to sort of write together. We didn't know what the fuck we were doing. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was, you know, I can remember sort of playing the guitar and she had her bass plugged into the stereo and we were just trying to make anything <laughs> even sound vaguely like a piece of music. And I think we realised that we cannot just jam. It, we don't have the ability. So we would go away, write the parts, learn them and then sort of come back together and that worked better. Ah, okay. Then I started, uh, um, then when I went to North London Poly to do a degree, I met Chris and Steve and Mariel, who was the first singer we had. She was singing originally. And we, yeah, we, so we were just at college together. And I didn't, yeah, I knew that Chris could play the drums. Yeah. But I knew Steve played guitar, but it, it was just the sort of like, do you want to join a band? Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah, <laughs> just, okay. Right. We're going to go for it. Brilliant. And I think we did, you know, I mean, we did a bunch of rehearsals. We had about five or six songs, and then we just started supporting bands in pubs. And wow. I'm sure we were absolutely fucking appalling. But <laughs> we were having quite a nice time, and it was fun to be a part of, you know, a scene. And I think, you know, bands like, I mean, you know, My Bloody Valentine were, I mean, they were well established because they were actually a garage band before that. And then when Dave, the singer, left, that's when they started you know, to become the My Bloody Valentine that everybody thinks of. Yeah. But um, Emma was actually going out with Kevin at the time. Oh, really? So, um, yeah. Wow. And I think, actually, maybe she'd split up with him by the time we supported them. But, you know, they were still friends. And anyway, so there yeah. was all this scene. And so we would, you know, and, and Emma had also, ah, oh, that was it, because she'd worked um, at a label, I think, Anyway, I'm, I'm getting my sort of timeline confused, but because there was this scene and everybody was knew each other, it wasn't that difficult to get a support slot. You know, London had okay. so many different venues, so many small places to play. And quite often, you know, people would want like a, a second support and you could just rock up and go like, well, we'll do it. 
you know, oh, cool. do it for 20 quid, you know right. what I mean? And, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, and, the sound that you guys had what was incredibly dense and 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 but it, it, it's it's to me it's dense but it's so it's it's light and i think that's part of the, the maybe the vocals and the the effects on the guitar it's just is that the sound that you guys wanted from the beginning is that the sound you were looking to get or because i've heard you say that you guys weren't real confident in your playing abilities was it a, a matter of just trying to to hide uh mistakes or is it a combination of that's the sound we want and luckily you know it hides you know any mistakes that we can make um, it's probably a combination. <laughs> I think because the time we were playing, there was this sort of, um, you know, like I say, the Valentines and um, I don't know, things like the heartthrobs. And I just remember supporting quite a few bands that had that quite jangly, melodic There was a certain fragility to some of what a lot of bands were doing. I mean, yeah. then again, we were playing with bands like Silverfish as well, who were just, you know, noise fest and, yeah. and you know, we played with Snuff, who are a punk band, you know what I mean? Oh, wow. So it was quite a lot of crossover. So I think all of those little influences came in. But ultimately, yes, we weren't great. Chris was actually a great drummer. He was the best musician in the band, for sure. Yeah. And the rest of us were sort of catching up with him. And I think, you know, a distortion pedal hides many sins, you know, so... Yeah. I think when I think of the Valentines, that or those bands, you know, that use of pedals was like, great, great. I'm, I'm going to get a chorus. I'm going to get a delay. I'm going to get a distortion. That's going to be mass. <laughs> All the floppy chord changes that I'm not doing properly. And so, but, you know, there was a lot of enthusiasm. And, and I think what was interesting was, you know, also that you're kind of learning on the job. You know, there's absolutely no way that any of us, like I said, apart from Chris, were kind of virtuosos uh, at, at whatever instrument we were playing. We were just constantly playing catch up while we were playing gigs or writing oh, songs, wow. you know. Okay. And I was, I remember I was going out with this guy, Johnny, who was in a band called Purple Things, actually, the quite sort of punky psychedelic band. And Emma and you know, I would ask him, I'd go like, okay, so what's this chord? And I'd put like one finger on a string and he'd be like, right, well, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> what, you're playing around it. <laughs> you know? And so it was that sort of like, well, it sounds quite good. So I'm just going to use that. Or if I'd go from an E to an E minor and he goes, that, mm, that sort of bit tricky in the same bit. And I was like, I know, but it sounds fine. Right? Yes. So, hey. And that was quite liberating. Yeah. But, you know, some of the weird chord changes and the weird, you know, melody that sort of slightly jars against the guitar part is because we didn't really know what we were doing. Well, we, that, that kind of no gives you rules. freedom. Absolutely. I'm just like, well, it sounds right. Yeah. You know, um, and I've always had that. You know, I've had that from people who are professional musicians who like Lash, yeah. but will go fucking hell. You know, I, I just couldn't <laughs> have put those chords because it's not right. It's, it's but, you know, if you know about music yeah, but, and you've learned it properly, you would not put that with that note. Right. But that's that's what makes some of the, the my favorite music what it is, makes it my favorite music is because it's, different than what, what somebody who's, you know, spent their entire life studying theory would do. So it's, mm. you know, it, it makes it unique and it makes it something I haven't heard before. Yes. And I think it's just making, I mean, if I'm honest, it's making virtue out of necessity because obviously it's far better to be able to play really well. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I think given our limited kind of <laughs> ability, I think we, we kind of did, at least we sort of, use that to some sort of good advantage, I suppose. You know, we were, our, our, our sort of ideas were always way beyond our ability, I have to say, but in a way that was quite, you know, it, it was good to be pushing against that, I think. And it made it more interesting. You know, you are sitting there thinking, oh, bloody hell, I must, I'm really tired. These, I only know like these six chords, so I'm just going to start making some up because I, yeah. I'm, I'm <laughs> That's awesome. And that, so you guys are touring and, and you put out some EPs at that point you're playing, you're playing club. You're not really touring. You, you, you're touring London, but so you're playing these gigs. You, you put out a few EPs and the next thing, you know, 
as far as I can tell, I mean, you get approached to uh, do an album, and then you're on the Lollapalooza tour in 92. Yes, well, that's quite a concise. <laughs> yeah. I'm just, I'm kind of narrowing it down a little bit, you know, just compacting the whole thing. Compacting yeah. like four years into like one sentence. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, our, you know, signing to 4AD was a big leap forward for us, I think. Again, that's sort of, you know, just being immersed in an experience where you're sort of slightly – you know, not, you know, you're sort of struggling to catch up. So working mm-hmm. with Robin Guthrie, working with Tim Freeze Green, being given all these brilliant opportunities because you're on a label like 4AD, you know, and a, yeah. a label that actually really cares about your music, not your necessarily your image, which at the time, I think, with a band with two girls, it could have easily gone very awry if we'd have signed to a different kind of label. Yeah. Um, but you know, 4AD was an incredibly nurturing environment. And um, so by the time I think we went on Lollapalooza, and even that was a sort of, we were sort of, it was really Perry Farrell who liked the band and our manager who got all matey with him. And then (laughs) basically we ended up on this tour where we were like, what the fuck are we doing? (laughs) This is insane. That, (laughs) that, that was the first time I ever heard Lush. I went to, uh, I was at the uh, show at Montage Mountain in Pennsylvania. And I, you know, I, I can only imagine that you remember bits and pieces of that tour, you know, venue, you know, one venue from the next. It probably, they look a lot alike. But for me, it was amazing because the stage was at the bottom of a ski slope. And then all the people would just kind of sit and put blankets up the ski slope. And we just kind of watch you guys play from the ski slope and <laughs> we get there and uh, me and, and a bunch of my buddies, we all went and I think, I, I think we may have missed one song. We got there and, and there's you and your bright red hair running around the stage playing. And I'm like, what is this sound? This is like this swirly. This is amazing. And so after the show, I mean, and, and you're on the bill with Pearl Jam, who's, who's just starting to break, you know, but Jeremy, I guess had just come out They're, they're their breaking sound garden is fairly established. Uh, Ice tea ministry, red hot chili peppers. And to be honest, I don't know how you did it. I don't know if you got a chance to watch many of the bands after, but being an outdoor concert ministry was the loudest fucking band I've ever heard. I was outside on a ski slope and I had to hold my ears and I never held my ears in an indoor concert. And I had to hold my (laughs) ears for ministry because it was so loud. It was insane. It was astonishing, yeah. But I mean, they I, I, they were amazing. You know, I didn't really know about most of the bands that we that were on that tour before wow. we went on that tour. I mean, the Jesus and Mary chain. That's played, right, yeah, the Jesus and Mary chain too, yeah. So I knew them, right? But, and what was remarkable was, and what really works for us was, when Pearl Jam were originally booked on the tour, it it was, as you say, before they became absolutely massive. And during, before the tour actually started, between when they were booked and when the tour actually started, they just became huge. Yeah, they exploded. They were like, no, we're still going to go on second. That's awesome. Right? So they actually, you know, they were offered, look, you need to be way further up the bill. And they were like, no, you know, this is where we agreed to go. This is where we're going to go, which was fucking great for us because loads of people turned up early. Yeah. You know, because they wanted to get their fee and everything for Pearl Jam. So we actually coattailed on that, which was brilliant. It was, it was a bit tough was. for the Mary chain. I think yeah. we went on after them. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. That, but yeah, and it's, and it's funny because uh, I was, I love Mother Love Bone. And when uh, that album came out and, and before Pearl Jam came out, I was keeping, I loved the sound of the guitar so much. And they had a big swirly sound on a bunch of their songs. And so that, that's really what got me into that, that sound. So I found out about Pearl Jam and went out and bought the album, saw 
went to go see Lollapalooza and heard that same swirly sound that I loved with you guys. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. So the next day I went out and, and bought Spooky. So it was, I, and I was just hooked ever since. That was just, that's how I got introduced to you guys. Yeah, I mean, it, it was such a great tour because, um, again, I think because it was only the second ever Lollapalooza, yeah. it was, you know, it was actually quite um, sort of, it was before it became all sort of, you know, various, oh, you can only go here if you've got this wristband or, you know, like festivals yeah. now are just so fucking complicated you can't bring your drink in here and you can't take your water in there and it's like it was just a bit of a free-for-all yeah and all the bands were in the same area they were all staying at the same hotel it was absolutely mental you know ministry were like i mean fucking out <laughs> was sure out of control you know <laughs> but in a really good way like he just made you know and everyone was sort of mixed in with each other and and, and it was just like a real again it was kind of this sort of traveling circus community yeah and although yes everyone had their separate buses we would have you know someone from pearl jam would get a ride with us someday and someone <laughs> else would want to hang out longer at some gig so then we'd go on a tour bus with ministry and you know so it was all really mixed up and everyone was really friendly and the crews were friendly and everybody felt like a, it wasn't competitive it, i certainly didn't feel that i was like yeah. wow this is amazing I mean, the thing it did open my eyes to was this whole other level of, you know, what big bands get to experience, like, which was genuinely frightening for <laughs> me because that that sort of groupy culture, ah, right? Okay. When you're in some piddly little band in London, even when you're playing like a decent sized venue in London, that just wasn't part of that indie world, right? Oh, okay. So we're going to these venues. I can remember arriving at this venue where this woman was chatting to one of the crew and she just had a thong on with a Bon Jovi backstage pass tattooed on her bum cheek. Oh, my God. Right? And, you know, every time, like, after Pearl Jam played, I remember there'd be this sort of wodge of women you know offering blowjobs to like crew members just to get back and meet Eddie Vedder and oh my God. you know all of that kind of I don't know it was all that part of it you know I think cues you know sort of having to move hotel rooms because there'd be and I'm not going to name names but you know <laughs> a band with like a fucking line of women outside that they were letting in three at a time and then Oh God! Out, and I just thought, oh, this side of it, uh, you know, it was almost the sort of, yeah, it was <laughs> the dark side. I'm gonna kind of switch off from yeah, that side. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, did that change anything for you? It's touring like that. Did it change how you played? Did it change any your writing? Because the, the songs, as the albums came out, the songs got less psychedelic and and less shoegazy. And, and a little more straightforward uh, rock. Uh, was it the building of confidence or was it just you just changing the sound? Um, and did you pay more attention to your gear at that point? Because I remember you were saying in an old interview that I had watched doing my research that you didn't really pay attention to your gear all that much when you guys were starting out. So did touring change songs, song writing, uh, your sound, your gear, anything like that? Um. I mean, to be honest, I don't think that we were ever a, a band that um, <laughs> moves. Oh, lovely. He can see you. I know, I know. <laughs> Who's in his uh, jalaba well, that's, wearing uh, this hangover wear? That's, <laughs> that's amazing. I love moose. <laughs> <laughs> this is fantastic. Got a moose cameo. <laughs> oh god sorry what was our answer um i don't know Let's see. yeah we guess we were just talking about how things changed after that first tour in, in, in a year oh the gear the gear the gear and the and the writing and all that. Yeah. yeah 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 so i think i mean i'll be honest um most of the sort of ideas for getting gear and equipment um came from our sound man who had worked with us from quite early on like pete was a real tech head and um, 
he, I don't, I, you know, I'm not someone who likes to sit around in guitar shops, like trying stuff out because probably because it's actually quite intimidating. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think now it's actually, now it's actually much nicer. People are nicer now. Oh, really? Like, I haven't, I haven't done it in, in years. Yeah, like to women, in, or, or certainly in the places I've been to, maybe because I look like an old lady, I don't know, but <laughs> <laughs> they're just humouring me. But, but you know, I, I think, you know, back then it really was like eye roll and sneer and like, you know, and you just think, oh, I can't go through this. So, yeah. you know, actually trying out equipment and things like that was just a bit too daunting. So I, I still use the same pedals I used pretty much from the start actually oh, wow. you know emma was the one who had all the sort of experimental stuff because often she had to recreate you know what we'd done in the studio and a lot of the swirly wordy sound was actually from the producers that we worked with so we worked with robin guthrie yeah or you know we worked with tim Fries green or you know any of these people and sometimes people would sort of say oh you know robin's just put all the cocteau twins kind of stuff all over their music and he swamped their sound but I still stand by the fact that, you know, the reason you work with someone like Robin Guthrie is because that is what he is going to do, yeah. you know. And I liked going in the studio with producers who would, you know, have these interesting ideas about sounds. You know, I'm not precious about that. Right, right. And, it, it you know, it did work really, really well for us. I think what happened was, you're right, that post uh, Lollapalooza, we actually thought, you know, we have actually got a lot better as a live band. We have played and played and played. We have done so many gigs. Yeah. And when I did vocals on Spooky, for instance, I mean, poor old Robin was so patient. <laughs> because I would be singing like, you know, like just so daunted at having yeah. to do this. Well, I can uh, imagine. But, I mean, it, you know, it's your first full length album and you've got Robin Guthrie behind the glass. You know, that, that's right. that's pretty intimidating. To working with Liz Fraser. Yeah. Like, so no fucking pressure. At yeah. You there. <laughs> 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 Exactly. Exactly. I mean, I can ima- I can only imagine. You know, as a kid in your early twenty, late, late, you know, late teens, early twenties, working with you know a guy who's made such an enormous name for himself in the industry and, and produced probably the, you know some of the your favorite albums at the time, it gets a little intimidating. Yeah, and you know, I mean, to be honest, the very first EP we did with John Fryer was you know. He didn't, you know, he he was just a really good person for our first thing. He just was trying to coax out what we were doing, you know. So anyway, the point being that, you know, we worked with these different producers like Mike Hedges, all of these people who brought their own stamp to what we did. And I think after Laura Pelosi, we did just think, well, why don't let's just actually think what we sound like, you know, when we're just playing, you know, it's not so we don't need to bring this whole different layer to it we're just going to play as we play 